One of the highest honors of the AAP is the selection of the COBRA lecturer. This is a lecture that's given every three years. It's been given every three years since 1925. And the list of previous COBRA lecturers reads like a who's who, giants in medicine of the 20th and early 21st centuries. And it's my great privilege today to introduce to you Fred Sparling, the 2015 COBRA lecturer. Fred is a graduate of Princeton University and Harvard Medical School. He trained in internal medicine and infectious diseases at the Mass General, and then spent, I think, a year studying microbiology, basic microbiology, with Bernie Davis. Then after a stint of service at the Centers for Disease Control in the Venereal Disease Control Division, he moved to UNC, where he served on the faculty from 1969 until his retirement last year serving in turn as chief of the Division of Infectious Diseases, chairman of the Department of Microbiology and Immunology, and chair of the Department of Medicine. He has served as president of the Infectious Disease Society of America. He's a charter member of the Institute of Medicine's Forum on Emerging Infections. Fred is a consummate clinician. He's an outstanding scientist. His uh, research early on identified transmissible genetic elements that encode antibiotic resistance. Some of the earliest reports came from his laboratory, and he's a very capable administrator, uh, as evidenced by his selection to chair both a basic science and a clinical science department. More importantly, uh, Fred has been a mentor and a friend of, mine, a friend of mine now for 40 years, which is incredible for me to think about. Um, he's a wonderful human being, as anyone who's had the privilege to serve with him at UNC will say. Uh, and it's a privilege for me to introduce you today and to look forward to your lecture. Well, I'm really uh, honored to uh, be so recognized and humbled uh, when Stan called me and told me about this some time back. I was a little paralyzed. I said, why me? Uh, and I've been thinking about what kind of talk I should give. And I decided the simplest thing to do is just be myself. And um, I am a teacher and a clinician and a scientist. And I decided talking about my pathway to uh, have this life uh, might be useful. Amusing, perhaps, to those of you who are the old Turks, because you know these things yourself. But it might be encouraging uh, for those young squirts here who are the group to which I uh, dedicate my remarks. Because you are our most vulnerable people, and also our most valuable people, because you are our future. So I'm going to. Uh, tell a story, an anecdote, no p-values or odds ratios, but uh, it's going to be about uh, how one does this, and you'll hear that there was a lot of luck, some bad luck, some good luck, uh, and uh, some twists and turns along the way, uh, not very much planning at times, not enough, and what I hope you will take out of this is that if I can do it, by God, you can do it too. <laughs> and when you MD, PhD students are finished getting your MD and your PhD and have to go back to do clinical work, uh, which puts several years between this and the start of further training in science, I hope you remember these remarks and take courage from uh, the journey others have taken and persevere because there have never been greater opportunities than there are right now, as I will discuss. So, we've heard about George Kober, who was a dean and a very important uh, person in public health and American education and administration. And we've heard about the very distinguished history of this talk, intimidating uh, many, many giants. Uh, I uh, thought about my remarks, and I read a few things. And the thing that stuck with me, at least 
as a stimulus for the title of my talk, which is A Doctor's Dilemma, was George Bernard Shaw's classical play, short, biting, funny, sarcastic, about physician scientists dressed as they were formerly and talking about the ups and downs in their scientific careers, clinical science that they were undertaking in this 1903 version of medical science, but still not so different from what we do now, uh, about their behavior, sometimes foolish, the bad things that happen to them and the good luck that influenced them. It's, it's worth reading. Uh, nobody comes to this point without having role models and mentors, and that was certainly true for me. I started with a kindly pediatrician who came lots when I was needing it. And it included being a house officer at the Massachusetts General Hospital once upon a time where I was lucky to be surrounded by a lot of very smart people, which is always encouraging and stimulating. That included Mike Bishop, who was a fellow intern who, as you know, won a Nobel Prize. It included Phil Majerus, who was an assistant resident, and he delivered this very same talk several years ago. It also included Ken Shine, not on this slide, who was president of the Institute of Medicine for a very long time, and John Parker, who was probably the best, in certain respects, the most stimulating and admirable physician scientist I have ever seen. So uh, I also was very much stimulated by the division chief of the Division of Infectious Disease, Mort Swartz, who was an exemplary role model, a dignified encyclopedic man who had a wonderful way with students and house officers and patients. Many of us tried to be like Mort, but it wasn't really possible, but we, we did try to follow in his steps. But luck is an important thing. When I was uh, a squirt, uh, I was busy trying to survive on every second night uh, internship, and also courting my uh, wife-to-be, Joyce, for two months. Um, and at that time, I missed, I was totally unaware that there was a deadline in this era of the doctor's draft to apply for a position at the NIH. Instead, I applied for what was left, a USPHS position, and the last choice on the list of the many possibilities that existed was assignment to the Venereal Disease Research Laboratory. And you can understand my shock when I got a call in the ICU one morning briefly telling me that they had found a position for me in the USPHS at the CDC in the Venereal Disease Research Laboratory. And I asked them, how long did I have to decide? And they said, 10 minutes. And I said, yes, sir, we'll come. Uh, I thought that was the worst possible job in the world. It was boring. The Quonset huts where we worked were World War II rejects. The clay was bare and hot, and we trapped grasshoppers to feed the primates. I learned to be a short arms inspector and thought, uh, woe was me. But I did have time to read, and in, in retrospect, that was the greatest kindness that ever could have been done because it gave me a chance to think about what I wanted to do, to think by myself with no mentor telling me what to think about. And I eventually decided that uh, I could probably do some genetics on the gonococcus. It had to be either the gonococcus or syphilis, so gonococci could be grown and syphilis couldn't. So that was it, and because it was lucky, it turned out that every gonococcus, as it occurs in human beings, and only as it occurs in vivo, is amazingly easy to undergo genetic transformation. They're constitutively competent to do it every cell of every strain, but only transiently as they occur in vivo. So I worked with fresh strains, that was lucky, it worked, and I enjoyed it. I really learned I liked to be in the lab. Indeed, so much so that after I wrote for Mort Swartz's advice, and he gave me a few suggestions as to what I might do. I went to work, as Stan said, with Bernie Davis at Harvard for a couple of years, where I got introduced to real science on E. coli and antibiotic action and ribosome structure. And Bernie taught me some other lessons, to do only work that's important and be rigorous. 
I went back then to do a final uh, clinical infectious disease years with Mort Swartz at the MGH again. And uh, by this time, I had been fortunate enough to have a couple of single author papers, including one in science, and I thought I was ready to go and wanted to go and had a job at a place that I thought was pretty good. But again, woe was me, the job was canceled when I sent them my startup expenses, which were modest by today's standards. And we were thrown out on the veritable street. But Joe Pagano found me at a meeting. He was a very good virologist and later director of the Cancer Center in Chapel Hill. And he recruited me and I accepted. And a second stroke of luck that Joe had a joint appointment between medicine and microbiology. And he convinced Lou Welt, the chairman of medicine, and Phil Minear, the chairman of microbiology, to give me sight on scene with no seminar. We would never do that today. A joint appointment with space in microbiology where I was surrounded by very smart people and Joe protected my time. And that was crucial to get launched. Uh, Well, we started to work on what I had done in Bernie's lab, E. coli ribosomes, but I could see very quickly that big labs in Madison and Berlin were going to swallow us up as we try to survive with two or three people in the lab and a part-time clinician as the lab director. I had uh, an, an opportunity which I uh, didn't anticipate when an undergraduate medical student who was well-meaning but uh, had poor grades, and I asked him what was his problem, and he said, I've been smoking too much dope, sir. <laughs> and I said, well, I can help you. I have a problem that I think is tractable, but I have no money to pay you, so it's a good fit. <laughs> and, um, and it worked. He made some discoveries. He got his life together and went on to have a very good career. And he got us started in the field of gonococcal genetics and biology at a time before anybody else in the world thought genetics could be done and should be done on a pathogen, especially that pathogen. So when the NIH decided a few years later that this was a field that should be supported, we had data and we had energy. And it was, again, a tremendous example of on-plan good fortune. Well, going back to work, on venereal diseases, uh, something Bernie Davis never thought was a very good idea, uh, was uh, even in this 2013 cartoon, something that uh, was kind of disreputable. VD clinics were in the back dark alleys then and to a certain extent, but less so now. You can see here there are two congressmen uh, being cheerful because Say, woo-hoo, we beat out gonorrhea in the list of public popularity. Uh, lice and, you know, and uh, cockroaches were higher, but gonorrhea was lower. Well, we had fun, and we got a lot done. Uh, in the briefest of summaries, I can tell you that we did work on antibiotic resistance and a lot of other things for 10 years, as well as the genetic systems for the gonococcus themselves. And in the briefest possible fashion, I can tell you that uh, the original mutation that the dope, dope smoking student discovered, which we designated MTR, turned out to be crucially important and very interesting. It turned out to be an efflux pump, which my excellent postdoc Bill Schaefer later proved. And it, in combination with porn mutations, which, which decreased entry through the uh, porn channel and mutations of the principal targets for uh, beta-lactam antibiotics, penicillin protein 1 and 2, had an additive 100-fold increase in phenotypic resistance to penicillin, and that in combination with the eventual emergence of beta-lactamase plasmids spelled the absolute death knell for the penicillin. Tetracyclines had their David plasmids emerged for assistance to them. Fluoroquinolones were very popular for a time but resistance to them emerged very rapidly, and we were left quickly with only oral cephalosporins as therapy for gonorrhea. That, in turn, as um, if I turned it up right, it would work better. Uh, that turns out to be a problem. The MTR pump is interesting for another reason. 
Among the many substrates that it recognizes includes host cationic defense innate immune proteins like LL37. Uh, there is good evidence in mouse models and inferential but reasonable evidence in humans that presence of this pump increases the ability to cause infection, i.e. fitness. It's very clear in mice. And this may be a reason why antibiotic resistance has been selected in nature far before we ever discovered and started using antibiotics clinically. Recently, there has been a tremendous amount of publicity about the so-called gonorrhea superbug, a strain which is resistant to any oral cephalosporin and uh, only responds to intravenous or high-dose intramuscular ceftriaxone. Uh, the clone originated in Japan, has spread to Europe, but not yet to the United States, but it has caused uh, a fair amount of alarm. Uh, perhaps this clone is less fit, and that may be the reason that it's not spreading fast, but nevertheless, I think we should be prepared and expect that we will uh, uh, develop further resistance uh, in the relative near future, and we're going to need something else. It's very interesting to me uh, that the meningococcus, which is a very close cousin of the gonococcus, and is exposed to the same kinds of environmental pressures that the gonococcus sees in terms of lots of antibiotics, has never developed any of these mutations to resistance. Why, I don't know. How did this ceftriaxone or, or high-level oral cephalosporin resistance emerge? It's interesting. The mutations to penicillin binding protein 2 in these clones are clustered, and there are many of them, uh, as many as eight or nine or 10 new novel mutations in the structural gene for PBP2, which all together enable high-level resistance. How did that occur? It almost certainly occurred in non-pathogenic Neisseria living in the pharynx, which then transferred a block, a cassette, into a gonococcus, which already expressed the MTR pump and the mutations in the porn proteins, so that now high-level resistance was affected. Uh, so I uh, have always had a propensity to do something different, getting bored after doing any one thing for too long. We decided to work on things besides antibiotic resistance. There were a lot of other people working on antibiotics and ribosomes and penicillin binding proteins. And so we decided to work on what was unique to the gonococcus, outer membrane proteins and pathogenesis, which included studies on the porin protein, other outer membrane proteins, lipoallogosaccharides, and especially iron receptors that are necessary, as I'll show you, for infection. Time only presents me to say just a couple of comments about the one problem. But what I didn't tell you was, because I got in a hurry, that at the time we made this decision to change what we are working on, I also made a big decision, a lifetime decision, to change my career. At that time, I was a very active clinician and had been fortunate to recruit people like Stan Lemon to come from being an intern at Chapel Hill to work in the Infectious Disease Division and others. And it was a good time. But I decided when offered to accept the position to be chair of the Department of Microbiology because I would be the only non-PhD in the department, as my students frequently reminded me. You don't really understand me because you don't have the right degree. But we did a lot of good work, and it was a lot of fun, as much fun as I've ever had in medicine. The transferrin receptor and the lactoferrin receptor here are shown in a cartoon. Receptors that recognize as their only ligands human transferrin or lactoferrin. Gonococci don't make citrophores. They don't make iron chelating compounds, which many bacteria do. They depend entirely on making receptors that bind absolutely specific the human proteins as their ligand. The transferrin receptor is made up of an integral outer membrane protein, TBPA, and a lipoprotein, TBPB. Working together, they bind transferrin, and when it's activated by an energy transducing protein, TONB, the conformation of the receptor changes. Transferrin uh, 
conformation changes, iron is released, it enters through the channel and is transported to the periplasm where it causes infection. The lactoferrin receptor looks very much like this, but interestingly, although 100% of gonococcal strains produce a transferrin receptor, only half of strains make a lactoferrin receptor, which is a big surprise to me because gonococci, when they're infecting the genital tract, which is where they usually make their home, of course, see not only neutrophil lactoferrin, which is literally spit at the gonococcus, but they see a lot of epithelial lactoferrin, which bathes it. So why do half the strains not make it? There must be a biological advantage in some other niche, which I don't understand. To test this, we decided to do what Craig Thompson said. Don't depend on animal models, but go to where the real problem is, which is human beings. So we and a couple of other groups have developed over 20 years an experimental human infection model only of males because women get sick and men are vectors and men can be studied safely. Infecting them intraurethrally, intraurethrally with a small French catheter, following them for five days and treating either when they get symptoms or after five days have passed. The questions are what gene products are important and ultimately can we use this kind of model as a cheap, effective uh, uh, proof of principle test for novel gonococcal vaccines? What we found, first of all, is that the transferrin and lactoferrin receptors are the only gene products which are absolutely required. Uh, others have a quantitative effect, but it's a yes or no effect with the transferrin and lactoferrin receptor. And if we asked another question, what happens if a strain makes both receptors and ask it to compete in a mixed infection with an isogenic strain which makes only the transferrin receptor, uh, the double pus transferrin lactoferrin positive strain wins. So the lactoferrin receptor as well is clearly important, again raising the question, why are so many not able to make it? Well, there are many questions. That remained, one of which is, can any of these proteins be used as part of a vaccine? I don't have time to explore this at all, but I will just say that each of the MTR e efflux protein, the TBPA transferrin receptor protein, and the porin protein are candidates for a vaccine because antibodies against them block infectivity in a mouse model. Uh, a, an analogous vaccine has been made for and group B meningococci that does not depend on capsular polysaccharide, which most meningococcal vaccines uh, contain, but rather recombinant outer membrane proteins and outer membrane vesicles. This should be possible to do the same thing for gonococci, but it hasn't happened to many, dis, uh, the disappointment of many, perhaps because of market considerations. Uh, at the time we were doing this, my lab was in high gear. I've never had a better lab. Excellent postdocs, excellent students, lots of energy, a merit award. Uh, and so you can understand when I reached another big branch point in my life, which was uh, the opening of the chair of medicine. I refused to be a candidate. I was very happy doing what I was doing. I served on the search committee and several candidates came through. I was offering them on the most precious thing we had, which was space for them to borrow to do research. But eventually, uh, I started to worry. Uh, I cared about the department, and it had very good people in it, including a person whose name you'll recognize, named Francis Collins, who had been our chief resident before that. And we had a lot of excellent faculty whom I thought I knew were thinking of leaving. Uh, so I changed my mind, and ultimately, uh, became the chairman of medicine. That was a hard decision because I was very happy being chairman of microbiology. So why would somebody do this? Uh, why become a chairman of medicine? Most of my colleagues in science tell me that's the worst possible thing you can do, and they have a point. Because every decision has cost. When I wasn't going to Gordon Conference and was only going to my lab 10% uh, of the time, each week, even though I tried not to travel, something is being given up. So there had to be a reason. I guess the main reason is I really cared about departments of medicine. And uh, that was where my first home was. Uh, 
I was deeply influenced by my first chairman of medicine, which Holly Smith and others will remember, was Walter Bauer. Uh, Frank the Buddha will remember Walter Bauer. Walter Bauer was a great man. He was a hard man. He prowled the wards at 5 a.m. And uh, he said, when I told him I'd been up all night, he said, congratulations. He, he was an all-in chairman. And uh, I remember it. So I like to teach. I like working with residents. I like stump the chair rounds. And I really wanted to work with talented faculty, which includes Stan Lemon and Mike Cohen and uh, uh, many other people. And um, I could mention Rick Boucher. And also the chance to recruit smart new people, like including uh, uh, David Brunner and, and uh, Beverly Mitchell. So it was a wonderful time. We had a very good department, and uh, it was very fulfilling. Pleasures that don't show on a CV, but were personally pleasure, including walking one of our interns when she was getting married, walking her down the aisle and giving her away when her parents decided not to come, which some of you will remember. That was a great moment. It was a really good job. But nothing lasts forever. Uh, after 10 years, it was another time to move on, another branch point. If my leg had been originally in medicine, and then I was standing on one leg in microbiology, and then on one leg in clinical medicine, and this, the fourth chapter, I was standing more or less on my science leg again with just some clinical work in infectious diseases. But this was a very good time also. Uh, I continued to work in the clinics. I continued to work with our sexually transmitted disease center. But after the anthrax attacks, an unexpected new opportunity was presented once again by serendipity. Uh, you remember this. Uh, this was after the Twin Towers attack and then there were the anthrax letters. And I was at a meeting at the Institute of Medicine Reform on Microbial Threats in November, one month after the anthrax letter. And I hope you'll excuse my uh, trying to mimic the accent of a speaker I heard at that time, uh, who was the former head of the USSR Biopreparat Group, who wrote a wonderful book called Bioterror. And he warned us that I've been telling you that we have not two weapons, we have 30 weapons. It takes two years to make a weapon. It takes 10 years to make defense. I've been telling you this, and you do nothing. By this time, he was working in this country, and he was our ally and advising the president. Three months later, George W. Bush announced a new program to uh, mount a big program to build BSL-3 and 4 research labs and big new research groups who were charged with making teams to develop diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines for bioterror agents and emerging infectious diseases, the RCEs. I became the director of the local southeastern one after uh, Bart Haynes at Duke was the initial. He then moved on to HIV, and I became, for the next nine years, the director. And it was a great time. We did things that I didn't, don't have time to describe to you, but the essence of it is that like running a department of medicine, where I had a lot to learn to work with everybody, we actually had to recruit teams to work. We had tryouts, like a baseball team might, to get the, rest the best people to work on it. And uh, we did get them to work together. People who didn't know each other and were very suspicious and were used to competing with each other agreed to work together in a collaborative way. Duke and UNC and Emory and Florida and Vanderbilt and UAB and as far away as Michigan and, and La Jolla. It was a wonderful time and very good work was done and we had such a good esprit de corps among the team. So what lessons can one extract from this story? Uh, you know and I know that there are lots of problems for you young students of medical science. I won't reiterate them all. You've heard some of them already. But I encourage you to do what I tried to do, is be positive and see the world through a glass half full pair of lenses. Uh, do what you do with love and commit. 
It's hard work. To do this well, you are wise if you choose a life partner who will help. Uh, I can't tell you who that is, but in my case, it was the woman I courted, as I told you, Joyce, who not only helped raise four kids, but had the drive and intellect to get her own PhD in midlife and her own academic career, and even then go on to found her own company. So I hope you do as well, because without Joyce paddling the boat with me, this would never have been possible. Um, telling the truth is a simple thing to say. I see Stuart Bondaran sitting here. He was my dean during most of these ventures, and Stuart has a lot of good qualities, but one of them was he always told us the truth, and the faculty trusted Stuart. And in running a lab or in running an organization, trust is crucial. So that's another little admonition from me to you. As scientists, I hope you don't give up being physicians because in patients is both fulfillment and a worthwhile activity, but it's also the source for many new ideas and also for translational research. And you need to, of course, search for your own serendipitous opportunities for unappreciated scientific problems. There are lots of problems. You cannot be at this meeting and not see the tremendous number of opportunities that new science is opening up to you. Uh, just as we've heard for cancer from Craig Thompson and many other people, the advent of next generation sequencing and high computer power has enabled us to do things that were never dreamed of a few years ago in the world of infectious diseases, to work on the microbial genome and ask questions about the composition of massive numbers of bugs in our gut and elsewhere, including bugs, that, most of which we've never been able to grow, asking whether there are syndromes and conditions that are related to changes in the overall composition. Uh, not Koch's postulates, but an entirely different kind of question. And a lot of papers, 3,000 papers were published last year in this field, but it's still only in the third or fourth inning, in my opinion. Many opportunities. We already know, for instance, that antibiotics, which we've been talking about and view as our salvation, are also a very serious double-edged sword because taking them alters our, micro our microbiome, sometimes for a long time, and it changes us and causes us to be susceptible to diseases which otherwise we would not have been. Uh, in the world of vaccine development, we have new techniques of, of sequencing and monoclonal antibody isolation and of epitope discovery and structural biology, even nanobiology, which will enable us to do things that we have not hitherto been able to do. There are lots of other examples I can I could say. People have asked me, would you do it again? And I say, yes, for sure. We don't know very much. Uh, there is great joy in learning, and there's great joy in working with very smart, committed people, as you've heard before, and you've seen at this meeting. The culture of science, something we don't talk a lot about to young people, is seductive. It's fun. People compete, but they're also friends. And uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to be working with and be part of the larger scientific enterprise. Patients will need you. I would argue that the world needs you. I wish you good luck in your choices, and thank you.